It's my real pleasure to introduce you to um, Dr. Joe Cambrai. Um, Joe is the president and provost here at Pacifica. Um, he's been involved here for many years um, and has a long and illustrious career before he has joined us. Um, Joe is past president of the IAAP, the International Association for Analytical Psychology, and as he mentioned earlier, the former US editor of the JAP, the Journal for Analytical Psychology. For years, he was on the faculty of the Center for Psychoanalytic Studies at Harvard Medical School. His numerous publications include the book based on his Fay lectures, Synchronicity, Nature, and Psyche in an Interconnected Universe, a volume that he co-edited with Linda Carter, Analytical Psychology, Contemporary Perspectives in Jungian Psychology, and a two-volume compendium, most recently, on research um, that we do have. Is the second volume out as well? The first volume came out. Both are out? Okay. Uh, I know at least the first volume is in the bookstore. Um, he co-edited these with Christian Rossler and Leslie Sawn. And Joe has a, a long list of publications as well, and um, numerous papers, journal articles, and also had a, a private practice in Boston for a number of decades. I won't list how many. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Joe Cambra. Thanks, Dave, and thank you all for your endurance, for making it all the way through the uh, end of this, which has been a very rich and full day, and I didn't know exactly what it would be like. The talk that I'll give this evening actually um, is a modification of a talk I gave about a month ago in Shanghai to a psychoanalytic group. Uh, and I didn't realize just how well it would, or not, well, you'll, you'll tell me afterwards, how it fits with today's uh, um, material. But um, I, I found myself absolutely fascinated from the first moments this morning all the way through until um, the end of the last two talks, which were uh, really great. I would just really appreciated that kind of uh, hands-on material. So what I'd like to do is start by dedicating this to Paul Lippmann. Uh, he's the friend that I um, had originally planned a very different conversation. We were going to talk about dreams. He and I have done this in a number of settings. He's a psychoanalyst who uh, got very interested in Jim Hillman's work and began to use it to understand dreams in a kind of um, hybrid. Uh, he wrote a book called Nocturnes, among others. It's quite a fascinating study. Uh, the way you can go, it, it transcends schools, and I think that's part of my own interest. I've always been syncretic in my thinking, and so the chance to dialogue with Paul, we were gonna do that, but um, since he's not here, I'd rather not just sort of do my half or active imagine him as my partner in, the, in that discussion, so um, I'm going to do this other thing instead, but I want to dedicate it to him. And really what it is, is it's a start for me of a project that's been in the back of my mind really for the last 20 years, and that is, I think it's a generational issue that we rethink the notion of the unconscious. That I, I think it's always a cultural construction, what that means, and it's not like I have an answer to that, obviously. But I think the questions of what go into it and the metaphors and how they're formulated and what, the, what it is experientially is not something that's codified. It's, it's never in some kind of final form. It's always in, it's a very mercurial notion. I, I think the spirit mercurius is in fact deeply behind the notions of unconscious process. And I tend to think nowadays much less structural than the people at the beginning of depth psychology. I don't think of structures in that kind of more um, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, architectural kind of form, but I think a process. It's much more fluid for me, and I think that's actually the way a lot of things are experienced, more in the kind of, the way they um, activate and, and occur within moments. So, I also am recognizing with that the theoretician's perspective is never um, outside the, the formulation. So the culture and collective dimensions of any notion of the unconscious is going to be fundamental to that, that very construction. So for me, what that means is 
a lot of my career in the last 20 years has been dedicated to looking at the interface between complex systems and uh, analytic process. So I'm particularly interested in complex adaptive systems. I'll give you a little bit of um, uh, information about them. They have these um, remarkable properties, and much of nature uh, behaves as a complex adaptive system. If you put a bunch of agents, and they can be anything from subatomic particles to human beings to galaxies. You know, I mean, if you want something archetypal, you don't get any bigger and broader than this. But whatever it is, if they are interacting in a competitive environment, uh, they can spon spontaneously self-organize and create emergent forms that have properties of the whole that transcend anything of the that you can find reductively uh, within um, the parts. You cannot reduce it. And the interesting thing, if you look at the diagram, is that you've got a feedback loop that not only do you form an emergent structure, but then that changes the interactions of the partners, which then changes the emergent form, and you get a very dynamic flowing process. Liquidity of water was one of the most obvious examples. You wouldn't expect it to be a liquid at room temperature. It is why you can't find it in any of the any molecule. It doesn't exist, or it's the interactions between the molecules. Um, and applied clinically, Jung's model here is actually a kind of an example of that. You know, this is it's close to Marsha's talk this morning. You recognize, if you have patient and analyst, these fields of interaction between the two that don't belong to either one. But that's an emergent form. It takes on properties. And we'll, I'll give you some clinical examples a little later in the talk. But another example that we're all, that ties into what we're talking about today is the human microbiome. You know, that is, if you take a human being, if, if they were not exposed to anything environmental, you'd be about 23 to 25,000 genes. That's the shocker of the Human Genome Project. In fact, when you take one of us, We've got about five to 10 pounds of extra stuff, fungi, uh, bacteria, viruses, all that kind of stuff. And that adds up uh, to, though, something like in the order of two million genes. So you go from 25,000 genes as the raw human being to over two million genes when you take our full microbiome. Well, that means that an awful lot of us is other. I'm, I'm, this is a setup for altered states. I want to talk about biological intelligence, and I want to talk about the biome as part of what's intelligent in us that affects us all the time, and how do we begin to engage with this. This deliberately is showing a, a kind of cultural, uh, ethnic fantasy. And any of you who travel extensively know when you go to different cultures, you often have distress, GI distress, for example, or sleep distress. It's a lot of it's tied up with the microbiome in one uh, locale getting translocated someplace else, and it doesn't like what you're feeding and giving it, or the other microbes and other fungi and everything else that your body is um, uh, sort of trying to acclimate to. So it's absolutely a fundamental thing in our everyday life, and that means we are an emergent system. The human being is not some uh, individual concrete organism. Now, emergent systems can be something that are um, enduring in time, or they can be uh, very um, sort of uh, just in the moment, uh, epiphenomena. For example, here, here's an example. The bridge itself is the emergent form. These are ants in South America. They need to get from one rock to the other. They put their bodies out and lay them out. Into, they create a bridge because it's a functional adaptation. The bridge is something that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in their minds. They're, they don't have minds in quite the way we're thinking of it. It's not an internal image. It's an environmental image. It's part of a construction with the ecosystem that they're responsive to. And it is intelligent. So, Now, applying this to the analytic situation, the notion of emergence, um, gets us to some interesting ideas. This is the Boston Process of Change study group. Um, Dan Stern, and uh, he spearheaded this, infant researchers. And what they were looking at is, what really is mutative? What really creates transformation in psychotherapy? You know, at least they analyzed thousands of hours of, of this kind of stuff. And what they began to realize is, mu the interpretations were secondary. 
you know, the, trying to get to a really good, accurate interpretation was not really the main stage. What they were looking at was they said, well, you know, if you look at all these hours, what you see is that people start interacting. Typical sessions go, people come in, talk about something in their life. Well, my job, my spouse, a couple of fights I was in, and, you know, whatever happened during the week. And then they start to move towards something that's a little more present, about how I'm feeling now or what's going on for me in the moment. And so that's the first transition out of the talking about starting to go deeper into now. And as you uh, lean into the now, you start to get what they call a present moment. That is that affect starts coming up. That there's a, there's a kind of sense of, well, I'm starting to have feelings about what's happening in the moment between us. And it's that as that gets charged, it leads to a, what we would think of in the old days as a kind of transference situation where there's an anticipation of how you're going to respond to my emotion. And that anticipation uh, leads to uh, the possibility of a transformative motion, moment, what they call a moment of meeting, if it's met with something uh, more healthy and more adaptive and more engaging with the person. So if you have a history of, say, anger, when you start to feel a little angry and you start to express it and you get shut down by, that's not okay, or you know, uh, something really negative, and instead you get an empathic understanding that looks at where that's coming from, not necessarily agreeing or not agreeing, that shakes the system up. It's a moment of surprise that can open up. And one of these alone doesn't do it. But if you string a number of these moments of meeting together, they really start to restructure the personality. I mean, talk about altering states of consciousness. You go from one state where you're expecting this to being able to open the mind much more fully. So that's the kind of analytic application for some of this. It's also uh, being used to study consciousness. The whole mind-body relationship problem is seen in terms of uh, complexity and emergence, that the mind, uh, and even more the psyche, emerges out of the interaction of body-brain with environment, both human and cultural. It's that whole um, field of interactions that really is where mind and psyche are. It doesn't exist inside the cranium, and it exists in the interactive field, which is a much more interesting and powerful way to approach all of this, at least in my mind. So now what about states of consciousness? Let's begin to dive a little bit more deeply. Let's start just with the notion of depth psychology, uh, because I think there are an enormous range of states of consciousness. I, I think we have barely begun to identify. That's one project to, to really look at the complete range. It's, I mean, religious studies is certainly one place to go for some things that are a little you know, more uh, intense. But I, I want to also talk about more everyday experiences that are still a little bit outside of the range of the normal. And if you're going to do an analytic or psychotherapy work, one of the things you've got to do is be able to, to let go and defocus. You can't just be laser sharp with everything or you'll miss, you won't be listening to the unconscious of the other. That unconscious communication requires you to spread yourself out a little bit and decenter. Particularly what I like is the study of reverie. Tom Ogden in San Francisco has been particularly adroit at, at using these kinds of models. It probably goes back to mother-baby dynamics that the mother's reveries together with the baby's experience are the origins of kind of the sense of mind and relatedness, the taking turns there and so forth. And the idea is that in the analytic process, we begin to defocus and we let our fantasies come up. I mean, why do we choose to make this amplification or that interpretation? There's something going on in our mentation. It isn't just the patient, there, there's something there. I would argue that the active imagination in the way Jung used it for the Red Book was the origins of the beginning of the idea that reverie was something that could be used. It's a rather more forceful form of reverie in doing active imagination. But if you give it a little bit more mundane, ordinary, kind of quotidian expression, then there it is. And the idea of training, analytic training, is about becoming a kind of, in quote, analytic instrument. Well, as far as I'm concerned, what that means is tuning in. That's the ability to begin to let your consciousness tune into unconscious communications, whether like the diagram I showed of Jung's or like Mar Martha was talking about this morning. Uh, and 
you know, as Henri Ellenberger taught us a number of years ago in his discovery of the unconscious, the roots of these kinds of um, therapeutic techniques really go back to indigenous traditions and especially shamanic life. That that's where, again, the kind of being able to explore the, the complexity of one's internal world is uh, very much tied with the vision of um, the shamans becoming our ability to then listen and tune into the unconscious. And another um, area that I, I like to throw in here is play. It's a, it's a, an altered reverie. It's a sta altered state of consciousness. Just the idea of playing and children being allowed to play. It's one of the dreadful things, by the way, when I've been in China over the last 20 years, is how little time is given to play. It's not valued. There's, the society is so overcrowded and so competitive that children are not much allowed to play. It's something we have to, they, they have to learn to begin to value again in, this, in the society. That's why things like sand play are becoming very important and meaningful there, to create spaces for that. So Jay Frankel wrote about this, um, a psychoanalyst in a Winnicottian way. Uh, he called it the deep structures of the state of consciousness that drive the analytic process, that's play. And he goes back to Ferenczi, who saw neurotic patients as spontaneously regressing into, this was um, Ferenczi's language, about quasi-hypnotic states which activated transferential imaginings. Now that's, a, that's lots of technical language to really say that, that there's something deeply important and significant about um, seeming play. And remember when Jung is at, the, sort of at his wit's end, that's what he does. He goes out to the seashore and starts to play with stones and you know, builds little castles and towers and so forth. And that's the portal. That's a portal into a whole other world. Play is really very important for um, expansion of consciousness. I'm trying to move through some of this a little quicker. Now, at the, at the uh, beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, when the analytic schools were forming and codifying their models, um, the, the kind of non-local dimensions of the psyche were, they were being picked up by people interested in psychical research and study of the paranormal. We didn't have the language or the techniques to begin to capture some of those phenomena. I would argue that some of what we're learning to do now with complexity is beginning to have language and, and actual tools to talk about these non-local things. But the, the figures who were involved with psychical research are really quite impressive. We've already heard about a number of them. William James was one of the early people, Frederick Meyer, Sir William Crookes, Andrew Lang, the great uh, folklorist, Henri Bergson, who we heard about, Gilbert Murray, Hans Dreisch, the vitalist, um, E.R. Dodds, the great classicist, J.B. Rhine, who did all that stuff on parapsychological things, and on and on, and it's still in existence today. They have a website. So if you want to look at the SBR, you can find that they caught up with contemporary uh, uh, technology. Um, but I think if we start to use these kind of um, emergent processes in our understanding there, um, we're going to go well beyond the dynamically repressed, and we're going to open up to a more playful, non-literal understanding of altered states of consciousness themselves. Um, and I won't go through all of the recent stuff, but, but the, the turn towards the biochemical, the plant medicine, um, as well as a variety of meditative and sensory deprivation, on and on and on, all these kind of human technologies that seek altered states, because there's a deep longing in, in human beings to transcend just the ordinary that we're trapped in. I think that we have to see that's not abnormal. Uh, I mean, in some way, even altered states is a little bit of a misnomer, you know, because it, it's a privileging of a Western egoic position. I mean, really, that's what it is. And that we're talking about a fluidity of consciousness. I think that would be far more interesting as a, a formulation that we, throughout the day, we allied, we slide through all kinds of different personalities from the moment we're waking up, whether you're thinking of a dream or you're going on to something. And yeah, we, are, we structure our reality so that we work and live in ordinary worlds and we tend to value that state of consciousness, but you don't have to scratch very far to begin to find that there are these other states that are there. Um, 
So what about some of the things that have come out about um, altered states? Very similar to play. Uh, some features, heightened sensitivity, uh, affective lability, reactivity to stimuli, permeability of boundaries, and a tendency towards, in quote, regressed states. Now, again, that's a little bit pathologizing, but the idea is letting go of this kind of, uh, certain kind of cognitive frame. But the other thing that I think needs to be put into that is the noetic quality, um, that which is a keen intuitive capacity to respond to knowledge that's not easily articulated, and it's outside of direct conscious awareness. Um, I sometimes think about this, you could radically expand Christopher Bolas's The Unthought Known. In, if you put the subliminal in there, like we were starting to talk about this morning, you start to end up in, in this kind of place. So we can talk about it as a surplus of knowledge, or a surplus of meaning. This, this I'm deriving from Peter Strzok. He's a um, classicist who is, uh, his most recent book came out last year, Divination and Human Nature. Uh, and it's really a, a fascinating study where he starts to look at, and I'll, I'll get to this in a little while, the uh, surplus of meaning and how that, uh, how, that's what we're doing in divination states, that, we, that, that there are, it's overdetermined multiple multiple levels of meaning, and you can't unpack it in just here or there. It's like a quantum state. You know, we've talked a little bit about that, where you have all these possibilities, and you kind of you try to collapse the wave function, and then you have one reality. But the truth is, all the possibilities are still there. So that's kind of the the model that I hear coming out of Struck. But let's look at James. Uh, it's the state of insight into deep the depths of truth unplumbed by the discursive intellect. Uh, they are illuminations, revelations, full of significance and importance, all inarticulate though they, may, though they remain, and as a rule, they carry with them a curious sense of authority. So it's authority, it's kind of knowing something but not really being able to fully articulate it. And yet there's a profound sense to this noetic state. Um, of, it's an intuition that um, gives you a sense of certainty that you're onto something. And I think it's an adaptive thing that we've developed over the course of our evolution as a species. Um, and rightly so, and we, they've actually helped us. That's one of the things I'll come to. <clears throat> so what I want to do now is turn to two areas of research that I think are going to be helpful in all of the kind of study that we're talking about. Uh, one is the use of oracles throughout history. And the second is the exploration of intelligences not associated with the conscious mind. So the simple one, let's take just a moment for AI. I'm not going to do much on AI. We're going to have a conference that Steve's going to be uh, running in the fall on um, technology, and it's going to have a lot of the AI piece. <clears throat> but watching what's happening in contemporary culture around artificial intelligence, it's clear that it's becoming much faster than ordinary human intelligence at one level. Just think of the games now that the, the best go masters or the best chess players cannot beat these machines anymore. They're, they're, that level of intellect is mastered by the silicon world um, beyond the biological world. It's not conscious though, not in the sense that we generally think about consciousness. So I'd say it's got a kind of adaptive intelligence but without sapience. It, doesn't, it isn't like human uh, homo sapiens, that we are conscious of ourselves. It's, that isn't there. Um, to the optimists, AI will free us from unwanted work and disease. To the pessimists, humans will succumb to the power and blind authority of digital intelligence. Harari's done a lot of writing on this recently on a number of people. He's got several books out on this. But in the meantime, how are, we gonna, how are our views of mind and the unconscious to be impacted by these developments? So I want to talk about biological intelligence first, to at least get that on the, on the uh, screen here. Um, and our understanding of this has increased exponentially over um, the last uh, 20 years or so. We're beginning to learn to ask nature uh, questions that we wouldn't have even thought of. Here's one of my favorite examples from 2010. It's from a science publication. It's out of an engineering journal. <clears throat> what they're doing. Um, if you look over on your left, what you're looking at is a um, map of, the, of Tokyo. These are, that's the outline. This is Tokyo Bay out here. This is the city of Tokyo. It's outlined. 
These are flakes of oat bran, okay? It's a favorite food of slime mold. Slime mold's a one-celled creature. It's kind of like an amoeba, but when there's a lot of food, it clumps together and forms a slime mold, like you can see when you go out walking in the forest in the, in the fall. So what these people did was they took um, a map of Tokyo, put oat bran at the railway stations where they were on, in the, on the map, and then they put um, some slime mold in at Tokyo Main Station and just let it grow for 24 hours. Just let it do its thing. After 24 hours, this is the kind of network that slime mold had come up with in terms of how to negotiate the city of Tokyo based on the map. This is what it took engineers about 15 years to come up with. <laughs> now, their, their point was that engineers are not, you know, less clever than slime molds. <laughs> there was some question, I guess, in the way they framed it. But the idea was really, if you, if you know how to ask nature the right questions, if you start with good questions, nature can give you a, a wonderful first approximation to all kinds of things. That there is a fundamental intelligence in the way nature adapts to its environment. Whatever the, and this includes one-celled organisms. So think about that for a moment. If one-celled organisms can solve complex engineering problems, are, there not, are, are not the cells of our body, uh, you know, these trillions of cells in us, each one of them has their own distinctive intelligence. Now, they're coordinated, we know that. It's gonna be a series of what I would call <clears throat> nested um, uh, emergences. So within the cell, there are emergent properties. A small group of cells, they form an organ that, that has its own properties. Organs come together and they form a larger system, a subsystem and like parts of the brain and so forth. And all, overall, you get this nested series that gives you finally a very complex organism. It's levels of complexity that we're looking at. Um, and that's part of what we can learn to ask questions of those different levels of complexity. They answer different kinds of things. They, we can engage with them. If they're intelligent, is there not ways to, to engage with them as parts of the mind as well? I mean, look, if, we're, if it's our cells that are doing this, that intelligence is fundamentally in who we are. And so one of my questions is, is there a way to access? And are not some of the indigenous traditions, are not some of the use of them theogens and so forth, partly ways to access um, the way this enters the mind through imagery, which actually comes from these deeper intelligences within us. Uh, here's just a kind of evolutionary picture. You know, it starts with the Big Bang and it just goes, you sort of layers of emergence were matter, life, then mind, then culture. Uh, this kind of growing outward. And you know, the idea of a global mind, uh, uh, the planetary mind comes very much out of this. It, this is exactly the kind of thing behind James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. So that's the kind of question that we're looking at. What about in our traditions, uh, these psychobiological intelligences that make up the unconscious? Uh, I'm going to change archetypal theory a little bit here. Um, these can take mutable shapes depending on how we, <clears throat> consciousness, approach the unconscious. Uh, Jung is known to have commented, this is a quote from Jung. We know that the mask of the unconscious is not rigid. It reflects the face we turn towards it. Hostility lends it a threatening aspect. Friendliness softens its features. That's from Psychology and Alchemy, uh, paragraph 29. So through our dreams, we witness figurations of the conflicts and at times attempts at compensation and resolution. Dream imagery also holds relational intelligences, and for example, our object relations which we tend to personify into the denizens of our dreams. Now, that's a very legitimate thing to do. Active imagination then provides a pathway for engaging these personified intelligences. Developing a symbolic attitude can greatly facilitate exploration of dreams and reverie um, presentations from the unconscious, but there's, a, I wanna get at the noetic piece in addition to that. That's really where I'm heading. So, um, a clinical example. So this is a dream from a patient of mine from many years ago. Um, and in her dream, she said, I was in the beautiful woman's home. She had a wooden plank, flo wooden plank floors. We were lying on the floors taking, uh, talking when I noticed a brown centipede circling us. I asked if, her if I should kill it, and she said, no, it's our friend. We went on talking until I noticed it was quite close to me and had something. 
She said, this is wonderful. He's starting to trust you. He had turned darker and uglier. <laughs> then he came between us and crawled on my arm. The beautiful woman said, oh, I was really lucky because look what he can do. With that, he clicks open an ornate box, holds it open for us to look. Inside is a, um, incredibly beautiful jewels, bright, shiny colors. I saw a red jewel, a huge ruby. The beautiful woman said, whenever I can't find anything, I go to him. She loved him. Well, this dream pleased the patient enormously, but it scared the bejesus out of me. I, I said, oh my God, I, I knew her history, and I thought, we've got a psychotic break right around the corner. You know, and, and in fact, within two weeks, that happened. I mean, it, the, the dream was prognostic. This was, it was something oracular in the dream. I'm telling you, there's a biological incon unconscious that communicated to b both of us, really. Now, the great thing about this was that she had some knowledge about the history. She actually came to me because of uh, her previous psychotic break was really mishandled. And she wanted somebody who could begin to help her understand what, what had actually happened to her and process the experience. And so we were able to talk rather openly about that at this time. I said, look, the centipede has got something poisonous. I mean, centipedes carry that. And poison to the mind would be a psychotic process. So. What she was able to do, and the first time she went, she had a fugue episode and went amnestic. It just disappeared and was hundreds and hundreds of miles away from home before she was discovered. And it, was, it created a huge mess. This time she drove herself to the hospital and got herself admitted right away. She was back working with me, with me in two days uh, and, and able to get in and out of the hospital. And that, that was 30 years ago and she's never been in the hospital since. So this was really a fundamental dream. But nevertheless, a couple of things. One is, what was I going to do with this? I mean, I had already been quite cautious about taking this kind of case into a private practice, because I knew there was a psychotic history. And I thought, uh, it was only her real diligence in working on this that convinced me to, to do that. And this, for me, was a moment of crisis. Um, and one of the things I did was I, as a young man, I went looking for how do I understand that damn centipede? I mean, I could understand transference aspects of it and so forth, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I needed something larger to say, is this, should I continue? So this is the amplification that I eventually found. That in Tahiti, the two indigenous centipedes are regarded as sh shadows of the medicine gods and are never uh, disturbed or killed. Remember, should I kill it? No. If one can be induced to crawl over a sick person, that person will surely recover. Well, that's one hell of a prediction in this case. Because remember, it does crawl on her arm. So I thought, whoa. Now, the thing you could immediately critique me and say, well, what, what's Tahiti got to do with this? You're not Tahitian. This patient surely wasn't. My first wife, though, was half Tahitian. Now, the patient didn't know that. Uh, and there was nothing in my office that would have given that clue away. It's more, you know, similar to what your case was like. There was no external uh, indicator of that. But certainly when I found this, it, it wasn't lost on me. I mean, I mean, oh my God, there's a communication that's going on in the dream field here between this patient and, and me and my reception, her creation of the dream, my reception, what do we do with it? Um, and more recently, I've gone back to this now uh, and thought about, what did it mean in her dream? Um, he's starting to trust you. Yeah, that really was a, a, a very funny line because you'd think in terms of dream logic, it would have been, oh good, you're starting to trust him. You know, that you're, the, the ego is beginning to relax in the face of the unconscious process and form some kind of trust. But no, it says he. That the centipede, that, that what seems like a psychotic process, this very radical altered state of consciousness is beginning to develop a relationship not only with the patient's conscious mind, but I would argue very strongly that as the analyst, I was stirring up a lot of unconscious process and I surely was the centipede in that dream, that there was a transferential reading of that. And so he, the centipede, Joe the centipede, was also beginning to trust. And heavens, after that amplification, I did start to trust her dreams that they were really going to inform me whether there was real difficulty coming on the horizon. My relationship to her unconscious process was radically shifted by going through this experience together with her. So that's a way in which um, there was something prognostic in the dream uh, that touched me personally and began to get me into a different kind of relationship with the patient. So we had a transference um, 
counter-transference relationship that went through quite a transformation. Now, I won't go into much detail. I would not have presented this, uh, but about 25 years after that event happened, I'd never asked the patient's permission. So I was asked to give a talk on uh, therapeutic action, and I, hadn't, I thought of this case right away, and I went, eh, I didn't, I didn't talk to the patient. She called me up two weeks later and said, I, I, she'd moved across the country and said, I'm gonna be back in your area. Would you, would you be willing to meet me for one session? I said, all right, I'll see what this is about. Well, we have the session. Um, and at first, it's, it's something trivial, and I'm thinking, this can't be what she's asking. And I said, finally, after about 20 minutes, I said, is, is there anything else? She said, well, yeah. I've been wondering all these years how you stayed in working with me when I had that psychotic break. Why did you um, not just end the treatment at that point? She said, it's always bothered me that I didn't understand how you were able to do that. Were you just being foolish and grandiose? So I told her about the amplification of the dream. I didn't tell her about my first wife. It, it wasn't as relevant to her in personal detail. But when she got that, the, the thing that really shocked me is she said, thank God you didn't tell me. I said, okay, why is that? She said, well, I, the transference was already so intense, it was so magical, that had you told me that, I never would have been able to pursue my own life. I would have been absolutely bound. Not, whether we could have worked it through or not is another story, but I think I could feel the force of her passion the, about the timing of when this information was to be delivered. And how her unconscious brought me brought her back into the treatment, that that field had never completely dissolved, uh, that that intelligence was still operating for both of us, and there it manifested. So the same thing with so working with trauma survivors. Um, I have had some rather remarkable experiences with them. I'll, I'll give you a very, very brief, some of you have heard the story, so I'll keep it very, very short. This is a, a woman who was, had terrible sexual abuse as a, a very young child, um, who I had in treatment for a long time. Um, finally, we worked to a place where she asked if I would give a phone call um, while, I was, uh, while I was away on vacation. Now, that's usually a, front, uh, a boundary break, but in this case, with some consultation, I realized it was worth doing. So I agreed, I call her at the designated time. She's nearly hysteric saying, are you in Germany? I'm thinking, I'm in the Caribbean. I'm thinking, where is this coming from? So I ask, and she said, well, I, I had a dream last night. You were in the Black Forest and I couldn't find you. Just panicked. And so, you know, I, I got the image very quickly about abandonment. The, the same, I couldn't hold you in mind. You disappeared into the world of witches and ogres and monsters from childhood. So uh, we were able to get her back centered, and that actually was the last time I had a hospitalizer. Uh, but the next day, I was learning to dive. I was at the beginning of being trained in scuba diving, and we go out, and my, my, my dive master pushes me. I've got a positive transference to this guy, an ex-Navy SEAL. And he gets me onto the boat, probably prematurely. I'd only been one day at it. And he says, let's go out for an open water dive. So we get out about 45 minutes from the dock, and he says, now, let, he calls the divers, let me tell you about today's site, it's called the Black Forest. And I was like, oh man, am I gonna jump into this? <laughs> and, and you know, after the shock, surprise wore off, uh, I said, yeah, okay, I, I'm gonna do this. And so I went in, and of course, it was transformative for me. It was, I mean, it really was entering a completely other world. Talk about an altered state of consciousness in that this was at a time before the coral reefs were really being damaged by climate change. And everything was pristine, and it was just a radiant fairyland of, of color, rich riot of color with fish and so forth. And I got back on board, and I began to realize, it's like, oh, my God, um, the Black Forest is there for both of us. But what a difference, and it's appreciating that we were both inside the Black Forest uh, and not separate from it that was extremely important for me. Um, I wanted to just say one more thing about biological intelligence before I go on to the next section. That is, we saw uh, in the last presentation, we saw the uh, sort of root structures that link uh, trees, but there's something even more. There's a woman up in, um, in Canada, Suzanne Samard, She's, a bio, she's an ecologist, a botanist, and she works with trees and looks at the networks of um, connectedness between trees that are uh, taking, uh, the, the links are made through fungal 
uh, these mycorrhizal fungal who grow their roots into the tree roots in a symbiotic form. Trees give them sugar, they give minerals to the trees, and so that's all wonderful. But what we're beginning to discover, what Samard has really done the work, basic work on this, is that this is a huge communication network. These are like 50 square miles. They're enormous organisms. And let's say we get a beetle infestation uh, at one part of the, the forest, they start coming in. Trees there will download some phytohormones that give warning messages, and it gets spread. The, the fungal network spreads it to all the other trees, warning them they change their chemistry so that they now become unpleasant to the beetles, and the beetles, the infestation stops. A tree starts to die in the forest. It unloads its sugars into the rhizal network, which then redistributes them, even including across species, like you, like you can see in the picture here. Well, this is a form of biological intelligence that's of enormous proportions. And it's got this kind of rhizomal structure that's actually, when you look at some rhizomal structures, you don't know the difference between a neural network and a rhizomal structure, or the structure of the, the universe, quite frankly. I've got pictures of that, but not for today. But the idea is that these are very vast structures that have really very well-adapted intelligences. And if trees are operating at that level, and just think about world mythology, about trees and so forth, the, the maternal figures. These trees will actually feed their uh, the saplings. That's how they get to, from, the, from the forest floor up to the, uh, to the canopy. But they couldn't make it on their own. There's only about 4% of the light that makes it down to the forest floor in, in many of those forests. It takes the parents raising them up slowly. So, projections of a maternal presence in a tree seems to have a lot of good ecological scientific backing. And it's just worth thinking about that. So with this level of, of growing sophistication in our understanding of ecological organisms, uh, I think we need to rethink our notions of the unconscious to allow that kind of um, articulation of intelligence. So what are some ways that might, we might get there? Um, and this is where I'm going to start to turn to oracles. Uh, and the founders of depth psychology were very interested in um, ancient Greek culture, its myths, rites, and literature, and they often turned to the oracles. Just think about the role of Oedipus consulting at Delphi and Freud's use of that, the whole Oedipus complex. is a story about a, a, a divination. Actually, Oedipus's father, Laius, consults the Pythia at Delphi. And in that consultation, she warns him, you know, about having a son. You look, you don't do that. I mean, you know, you're going to be breaking this, um, you know, sort of bond with the gods. And he, of course, doesn't listen. And then the story I like is um, little Hans. You know, Freud's treating, uh, he's actually helping the father who's treating, trying to treat his own son. Really crazy. It's sort of soup, but uh, they go. The, the father and son come to see Freud for a visit, and in the visit, Freud, in a very grandfatherly, lovely way, gets engaged with the boy. He's about four or five years old, and he begins to tell him the story that before you were even born, um, that this was going to happen. You know, this whole Oedipal story. He tells it, but in a very lovely way. And on the way home, this is what I liked. On the way home, little Hans says to his father, um, so does the professor talk with God then so that he knows everything ahead of time? Freud just absolutely loved that. <laughs> the sense of, but here's Freud's oracle. Talking to God, knowing about what's to come, to be able to foresee the future, is that kind of fantasy. So... Let's talk a little bit about oracles. Uh, it's the person who's generally capable of dialoguing with the gods. We'd say the archetypes of the unconscious, usually in an altered state, trance, making pronouncements of knowledge from this aspect of contact with the unconscious. The knowledge itself is often ambiguous, needs interpretation. Um, there's been a history of dream interpretation. Think of Joseph and the Pharaoh. I mean, I'm not going to go through all of these. Lincoln, oh, there's one I like. Lincoln had a dream um, several days before his death, which ended with his question, who's dead in the White House? I demanded of one of the soldiers. The president was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. Then came a loud burst of grief from the crowd, which awoke me from my dreams. That's Lincoln several days before his assassination. 
I mean, that's really stunning, isn't it? I mean, you know, there's just something that knows outside of time and space. The oracular function um, that, that comes in there. Um, so, scholarship on ancient cultures in recent years has begun to look more seriously at the role of divination in the long-term political stabilization of various cultures. Several dimensions of divinatory practice outside of prognostic success have been noted in this regard. The, the consult, consulting the stars, common among many cultures, demanded this, consulting the stars demanded um, incessant reflection upon political and military activity, generating an atmosphere of political vigilance. The prediction of failure and defeat necessitated the ever-renewed study of the administration, the army, the security services, and so on, as well as the random verification of the trustworthiness of counselors and allies alike. Although society possessed a strictly hierarchical character, it was impossible for even per persons of the highest rank to exempt themselves from the scrutiny of their areas of responsibility through oracles. That's part of what Stephen Mall, he's a German uh, um, uh, classicist who's writing about ancient Sumer and uh, the whole Mesopotamian region, and says, look, these civilizations managed to go on for a couple of millennia. How the heck did they do that with all the instability in the region? And they were using oracles to do that. And his point is not, oh, that they were using them just for fortune telling. He was saying there's something about the way in which this divinatory oracular consciousness is being used to begin to create a larger political consciousness. And that that had a stabilizing effect on these societies. It's something we've lost, um, that these counselor roles could um, give you one more quote from him. The counselors uh, could present their opinions openly without gaining a reputation for being disloyal, ungrateful, insubordinate, or unfaithful. And they could work to ensure that their proposals would be made the object of a new oracular question. You know, if you were clever about this, you got the oracle doing the business of advising the king, not you. I'm, I'm not, you know, it's, what am I? Here's a good question to ask them. You know, see what they say with that. Um, now look, this. It, it's had some very powerful effects. In a paper a number of years ago, I wrote about the origins of democracy through Cleisthenes. He was the uh, Greek leader who, re the, the, Athens was being attacked by Sparta and they were really in bad shape. Uh, and so Cleisthenes was leading the, um, uh, the uh, polis and he got the leaders together and said, we have to reorganize the tribes. This isn't working. We're, we're being split into, the 10 tribes are all, each one buying against one another. So he reorganized the entire society and divided them up so that every tribe had members from each of the different occupations. So you had 10 different groups, but along completely different lines rather than these old traditional um, hierarchies. To get the names of the 10 tribes, he gave 100 names to the Pythia and Delphi. And she selected 10 names out of those that they then used. This is the origins of our democracy, was through this, um, uh, from the Pythia, this uh, the prognostication. Um, in this Aristotle on the Athenian constitution in part 21 says, the names given to the tribes were the 10 which the Pythia appointed out of the 100 selected national heroes. So it's a very good source of, uh, of this kind of um, recognition of the, divin the role of divination. Um, so I think of it in terms of pattern recognition uh, with interpretations of those patterns based on accumulated historical observations, even though the interpretive content was not always accurate or was obscure or ambiguous. There was a training in observational skills and a search for patterns of increasing complexity in interacting with the world, and that proved to be what's really useful, the ability to do that. Correct interpretations were often a life and death matter and were so given, and given so much importance that those who developed um, powerful intuitive functions were part of, that's the adaptive function. You had to develop a really well-honed intuition to survive under those conditions. Um, so if we saw oracles as assessing some of the unconscious, the intelligences in, in, in the unconscious and presenting these to conscious awareness for our contemplation and reflective consideration, um, that might help us take another step. Let's 
for just a moment. I've got a few minutes left. The most famous site in ancient Greece was, as I've been talking about, Delphi, and the, where the Pythia, uh, uh, a woman, turns out she was usually in her 50s. She was sort of an older woman. Um, and this was considered one of the most sacred sites in ancient Greece. It operated from 1400 BCE to about 400 CE. This is the, unfortunately, this is the only known um, sort of image from that period. But I, I'm, I don't have time to get into this today, but why did it end at 400? You know, why did, I have some idea of why it began in 1400 BCE, but why 400? You know, it had to do with the kind of uh, monotheistic religions taking over the, the area and the suppression of this kind of thinking and the loss of the oracular, uh, that, that capacity. So there were a lot of debates that were going on in the 19th century and into the early 20th, 20th century about the Pythia because people like Plutarch, uh, the historian who was also a priest of Delphi, uh, claimed that there were gases that the uh, priestess uh, was inhaling. And when they, when in the late 19th century, as people went there, they couldn't find any cracks or crevices. But what happened at the, in, in late in the 20th century, uh, as the uh, imaging techniques got better, some geologists went there and sure enough, they found fault lines and they found cracks that had been there all along. And in fact, there, there's very ample evidence that there were a series of hydrocarbon gases, methane, ethane, and ethylene. And ethylene's the one. Ethylene was used as a uh, anesthetic in surgery up until the 1970s. And it, it has a sweet smell like was described. And in low doses, it's capable of producing hallucinations and altered states of consciousness. Duh, <laughs> you know. So in fact, there was something very fundamental there. Now, I apologize. This is one of the few pictures. This is from the 19th century. You got an eroticizing of the oracular here. Uh, you can see it, you know, in uh, Collier's uh, painting of this. But the idea of the crack uh, with the uh, gases, which was dismissed by the logical positivists. Oh, that's that's bull, and it wouldn't happen, and so forth. Well, in the 21st century, we're discovering, in fact, that was accurate. Now, that's interesting. It's coming, if you take the lateral move into, into contemporary culture, what's that about? How come we're now finally getting the technology that allow us to see the reality of this, which we couldn't see up until the last 15, 20 years? I think that's not an accident. I would take that as a cultural synchronicity. You know, that is the, the, the co, co uh, occurrence of this is happening at a moment when we're ready to start to pay attention to this again. So this is, in a way, I'm saying, you know, I didn't dream this up out of nothing. Um, this is the kind of uh, <laughs> evidence that goes behind it. So the little bit about the Pythia. Uh, she was imagined to be influenced by the gods, particularly Apollo, through the noima she inhaled. And this is the airy realm that was seen as the domain of the spirits, where the soul might converse with daimones and gods. According to Sarah Ills Johnson, she's a classicist, Democrates explained uh, divinatory dreams through a, a theory of idola. He saw the things of the world slowing off idola, which can penetrate the soul of sleeping persons. This includes idola from another person's thoughts or feelings, which leads to a form of precognition. This is Democrates in the ancient world. And according to Cicero, and this one I, I always get a kick out of, this is Cicero. In autumn, when the air is rougher than usual, these idola don't travel very well, and our dreams are therefore rather faded and ineffectual. He thinks that you know, the kind of um, communication of precognitive dreams is not very good in the autumn. <laughs> so if we deliteralize that a little bit, this is kind of folkloric description of a non-local psychic field, this airy realm. Uh, which is, which re, its reception is impaired by agitated media. So here, calm air, a tranquil mental state in the face of fluid imagery, is conducive to perceiving this field, whereas autumnal conditions, disruptive transitions towards dark and cold, disturb and inhibit the reception of the non-local imagery. So there's a, there's a subtle piece of um, advice, I think, to the kind of states of mind that allow us to engage with this kind of imagery, these, these idola, uh, as they come up, if we want to tune into them. I think the last thing I'll do, yeah, is just talk a little bit about uh, Jung and China. Uh, you know, in China, the oracular tradition started with the oracle bones 
in, that's in the Zhou Dynasty, this is about 2000 BC. This method was superseded by the development of the I Ching, uh, refined and employed by some of the best philosophical minds in China throughout the centuries. The Book of Changes meaningfully entered the analytic depth psychological world through the trans translation into German by Richard Wilhelm in 1923, for which Jung eventually wrote the foreword in 1949. Since his receipt of another of Wilhelm's translations, that of the Taoist alchemical secret of the golden flower, Jung had grown increasingly interested in the com complementary nature of Chinese philosophy to Western science. He regarded the incompleteness of the purely causal Western approach to understanding reality. Valuable insights gained by attending to the qualities of a given moment, paying heed to the coincidences occurring in time, are fundamental to the methodology of the I Ching. That's really what it's looking at, it's catching the kairos of the moment. In our comprehension of the world outside of the scientific laboratory, Jung noted, oops, sorry, right here, um, if we leave things to nature, every process is partially or totally interfered with by chance, so much so that under natural conditions, a course of events absolutely conforming to specific laws is almost uh, always a, an exception. And then he continues a bit further. Um, the moment of under actual observation appears to the ancient Chinese view um, more of a chance hit than a clearly defined result of concurring causal chain processes. The matter of interest seems to be the configuration formed by chance events in the moment of observation, and not at all the hypothetical reasons that seem to account for the coincidence. So we're getting into a new relationship to coincidental phenomena. In making these statements, he's opening our analytic attitude to awareness of meaningful coincidences, especially when uh, analyzed in the field of the whole situation, the Gansfeld. Um, this can be read as a psychoecological formulation of mind, applicable in detail to the therapeutic encounter. Now, one step further, in questioning of intelligences in the I Ching oracles, that question rose for Jung. In terms of explaining to the un uninitiated Westerners his experience in using it through, he did a personification of the book when he threw, asked it a question about itself. It's a really interesting little, little um, sort of formulation. And, it, it, he, and what he writes, it says, according to old tradition, it is spiritual agencies acting in mysterious ways that make the yarrow stalks give a meaningful answer. These powers form, as it were, the living soul of the book as the latter is a sort of animated being. The tradition assumes that one can put questions to the I Ching and expect to receive intelligent answers. Well, this is what I'm talking about, intelligences. Here, here it is. Here's Jung's capturing it within an oracular divinity, divinatory kind of um, system. What I would call now, following this, intelligences of the moment. This, these are intelligences that capture something about the essence of here and now, what's happening. That's a wonderful kind of capacity. Discerning the adaptive qualities implicit in the gestalt of the moment reveals the potential access as a profound and guiding intelligence which can be constellated in the unconscious as a cosmic reflection of the moment. Perhaps we have here a method to glimpse the intelligences operating in, the moment, in moments of complexity. If accurate and resonant, this would expand the view of the unconscious to include the agencies at play in the psychoecological field. And this could provide a pathway for conscious reincorporation of elements of indigenous psychologies back into our reflections on the meaning of what is depth. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I think my time is up. I'm going to bring this to a close and with that open up if you have any questions, we can kind of play. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you.